is there, is there some way that they can maybe just throw up their hands and, and just pour a bunch of concrete on this and call it a day? I think eventually they may get to the point of throwing up their hands and pouring the concrete on. They can't do that yet because the cores are still too hot. So we're going to see the, the dams we're in for another year or so until the cores cool down. Um, at, at that point, there's not uh, anywhere near as much decay heat, and you probably could consider filling them with concrete and just letting them sit there like we have at, at Chernobyl as a, as a giant mausoleum. That would work for Units 1, 2, and 3. Um, unit 4 is still a problem because, um, again, all the fuel is at the top. You can't put the concrete at the top because you'll collapse the building. And it's so radioactive, you can't lift the nuclear fuel out. And um, I used to do this as a living, and, and, um, and Unit 4 has me stumped. Hmm. So what do they do, do you think? I think they'll be forced to build a building around the building. And then, because you need heavy lifting cranes, uh, cranes that lift 150 tons, which are massive cranes, um, to put the nuclear fuel into, um, into canisters, which then can can get removed. Um, that's sort of what happened to TMI, but all of the fuel at TMI was uh, was still at the bottom of the vessel. But it was a three-year process to get the molten fuel out of, out of Three Mile Island. Four years, actually. So um, the problem here is that all of the cranes that do that have been destroyed, on, on at least on units one, three, and four. So and you can't do it in air. It has to be done underwater. So my guess is they'll have to build a building around the building um, to provide enough shielding and, and water so that they can then go in and, uh, and put this fuel into a, a heavy lift, lift canister. Okay. All right. I hadn't, I hadn't considered that. That's a great insight. So let me summarize here. We have, we have these four reactors. Three of them have melted through. Um, one of them is... is uh, uh, unit 4 is probably one of the more dangerous ones in, in the sense that um, it's going to be years to build a building around it. It's going to be years until uh, really the situation is contained. And, and in Unit 4, though, we're, we're still concerned that in the year or two or however long it takes to, to build a building and sta really stabilize that, another aftershock could come along. Or uh, in the case of Unit 3, uh, if another aftershock comes along and um, you know the, the pressure vessel is full of water, there's, there's a chance here that we could see um, some other event. Some, you know, that this, this situation is not yet fully stabilized in the sense that there are still surprises uh, to be found. It's surprising where the water shows up. There might still be some surprises um, left in and how the buildings behave or, or, or systems uh, hold up or fail. What else would you add to that summary? The groundwater. Uh, I am very concerned that I am hearing nothing about groundwater monitoring. We know the ocean, we know there have been leaks into the ocean uh, I'm not convinced that there's not cracks in the structures that are allowing this highly radioactive water to get into the groundwater. And I've been talking to people in Japan, and my recommendation there is that they should build a, a moat all the way around the reactor, about down to bedrock, which is 60 feet or 20 meters, and about uh, four and a half feet wide, which is a, <clears throat> a meter and a half wide, and fill it with a material called zeolite. And it, it, it's a very good absorber of radioactive material, and it would prevent the outward migration of any of this radiation. Um, that's not happening, and I don't understand, um, I don't understand why. So you know, we look at the buildings, and we look at stopping the, the heat and the radiation that's going upward. But there's an enormous amount of, of radioactive material in the soil right now. And um, you know, one of the prefectures nearby uh, had radioactive sewage sludge. And um, someone who watched our site is an executive in a uh, sewage business, and he said it's not uncommon after an earthquake for groundwater to infiltrate a sewage system. And that frightened me a lot, because if the groundwater is already contaminated out in these uh, prefectures, um, it could be um, the, the serious problem that is receiving no attention right now. So um, how, how, generally speaking, do you have a sense of how fast groundwater migrates? I mean, is this something that, that will be, you know, three miles away from the plant in um, 10 years or in 10 weeks? Um, what, how, how big of a problem is this immediately? Uh, I don't think it's an immediate problem. Uh, but I do think unless, um, uh, and, 
unless mitigated pretty quickly, it can become an immediate problem. You know, it moves slow, but if, if, if it's already out of the barn, um, it's going to be harder. The further out you have to build this trench, of course, the bigger the trench has to be. Um, so my goal is to, is to trap it near the source rather than let the, let the horse get too far from the barn. Okay, well, th thank you for that. Um, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to move on um, to a, a part for our enrolled members, and I'd really like to talk about what the actual impacts of this are on people. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. So yes, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, personally now, much more than I used to be, I think, in, in really thinking these issues through. Uh, so the first thing is, here's, here's where I'd like to start, because this is where a huge source of, of confusion, and the media hasn't helped this one a lot, is the difference between radiation dangers and contamination dangers uh, from radioactive particles. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah. There's, um, there's three kinds of radioactive um, material. Uh, there's gamma rays. The, initially, when the nuclear reactors blew, they emitted large clouds of, um, of xenon and krypton gases. Um, those are noble gases. They don't react with your skin or anything, but they emit gamma rays. So the readings you saw with people walking around with the Geiger counters were from essentially being in a cloud of gamma rays, hitting them from the outside. Um, and, and that's significant, but it's also uh, dispersed over your entire body. Um, to my mind, the bigger problem are the other two ways that radioactive material um, uh, decays. And those are called beta particles and alpha particles. Um, they don't travel as far, but they have an enormous amount more energy than a gamma ray. So if, if they lie in your skin, you're just fine. You can wash it off and, and, uh, and, and life goes on. The problem is if they get inside, they can uh, selectively go to, a, to an organ and, um, and bombard a very small piece of, of tissue with a lot of exposure and potentially cause a, a cancer. And that's what we call um, the hot particle. So the, all of these particles are radioactive. Um, but when you talk about contamination, it means almost always that one of these particles gets attached to an organ and begins to, um, to bombard that organ. So with radiation, there's three types. There's the alpha particles, which is a particle. We've got beta, um, which is a particle. And then we've got um, gamma rays. And, and so I guess when we're saying radiation, it's like saying um, somebody says, uh, oh, let's talk about cars. Well, well there's Lamborghinis. Um, there's, there's VW Beetles. There's Mustangs. There's all these different things. So we have to, first we have to know a little bit about that. And, and radiation exposure levels, as I understand them, are set at sort of the whole body level. It says you can have so many REMs, which you could get a REM of, of alpha particles hitting. You could get a REM of beta. You could get a REM of gamma. It's just sort of a standardized way of saying, you're going to get this whole body exposure. We're just going to hit you, like when you go to the get an X-ray or something. It's just you're going to another type of radiation X-rays. So, so that's one part. But but the the contaminated particles that happen to be emitting radioactivity are the issue because they can they can localize. Um, just make it simple. We we inhale a 10 micron particle and and it happens to be radioactive. It goes into our alveoli and our lungs and sticks there potentially. Um, and it's now going to, in a very, very, very small, very close way, intimate way, be bombarding the tissue around it, uh, that particle for however long it happens to be radioactive or until it gets excreted somehow. So, so the idea here then is that radiation tells us sort of something, but very few people actually die from radiation, as I understand it. It's a very rare event because you need a lot of it on a whole body level to really take somebody down. But contamination is a whole different matter that uh, the lethal dose from contamination can actually be really small measured on a radiation scale. I'm thinking now of um, this guy, Livchenko, who was actually uh, poisoned. He was a, a Russian dissident. And he was poisoned in London in 2006 with a very, very small amount of polonium-210. Uh, it's an alpha emitter. Um, he got that in his food somehow. And, uh, and then because of where polonium goes, uh, uh, it, it ended up killing him, I think, very rapidly in nine or ten days, um, considering. So, so is the thing that I, I really want to... Um, invite people to consider is that the, the real key around contamination is to not get it in your body. That's, that, that's part one. Uh, how, how would people, I mean, how do you do that? If you're, so let's imagine, Arnie, there you are, you're living in Tokyo now, you're, or somewhere closer. Uh, how would you be behaving over there right now? Yeah, and actually, um, 
we should extend this to the, the West Coast because we're seeing particles there too. But um, to answer your question about Tokyo, um, what, what I'm advising people in Tokyo who are there now is that, no, take your shoes off at the door, wet dust. Don't dry dust. We're actually finding that contamination inside houses is higher now than contamination outside because it's been trucked in over the last two months and it hasn't it hasn't left. Um, and if you dry dust, you throw all of that radioactive material up into the air. I'm also advising friends there to um, um, to buy these little HEPA filters, uh, high efficiency particulate filters uh, that look like a little round um, round device that sits on the floor, and um, and change the filters frequently. Um, we're also advising people to, um, to remove the filters in their air conditioners and in the air conditioner in their car and replace them. Um, because you know, they've picked up hot particles over the last couple months, and it's, um, it's a good time to, um, uh, to replace them as well. Also telling people, don't do any demolition work. The last thing you want to do right now is tear a wing off your house because you'll stir up that dust, uh, not knowing exactly what's in it, um, you, you run a risk of, um, of contamination. The other things we're, I'm telling friends in, in Tokyo is keep your eye on Unit 4. And uh, if, there's, uh, if there's an earthquake and Unit 4 topples, uh, don't believe the authorities. You know, you're, you're well beyond where science has ever imagined, and uh, it's time to get on a flight and get out of there. Don't ask any questions, just move. What about, um, what about food? I mean, I, this is a big issue, and I would think this would be potentially an issue for people um, on the west coast of the U.S. even, is the idea that um, there are certain isotopes up there and particles that could somehow get into the food chain, maybe through milk, because, you know, cows graze a whole lot of grass and turn it into a very little bit of milk, helping to concentrate whatever was on that grass, or leafy vegetables that have a real affinity for certain of these isotopes, potentially cesium, certainly iodine, if that's still around. Um, which it shouldn't be, but apparently it still is. How, how do you? How would you approach food? Because that's one quick way to ingest things. Yep. Well, the cow milk um, predominantly would have iodine, and we're out now at 80 days, and and most of the iodine should have disappeared because it has an eight-day half-life, and the rule of thumb is 10 half-lives. But we're still seeing iodine, which is kind of strange, and it gets back to that issue of criticality, recriticality that we talked about earlier. Um, so I'm still telling friends to, to, until the, the middle of June, stay away from stay away from milk and, and dairy products. Clearly, washing the uh, the vegetables is critical. Um, in Japan, we're saying uh, avoid fish caught in the Pacific, um, unless you know they're caught a long way away from Fukushima. I'm saying within 100 miles of Fukushima, don't even consider it. Um, I think that will actually get worse with time. Um, Greenpeace has some numbers that came out indicating that it is worse with time. Um, so we're telling um, the, the, the Sea of Japan is a different story. You can, pro you can probably feel safe eating fish from the Sea of Japan, but if you believe it came from the Pacific, avoid it. Um, there's two isotopes there. The, um, the, the predominant one is cesium, which is a muscle seeker. So, of course, fish meat is muscle, and, um, and cesium is uh, likely to build up in your... Um, in your body if you take it from fish. Um, the other one is strontium, which would be in the fish bone. Um, so uh, unless you, you have some kind of a delicacy that uses the fish bone, eating the fish is, is um, unlikely to expose you to strontium. So um, eventually, though, we're going to see top of the food chain animals, like tuna and salmon and things like that, that have th this process bioaccumulates. The bigger fish gradually get higher and higher concentrations. Um, and I, I am concerned that the FDA is not monitoring fish entering the United States because sooner or later a, a, a tuna is going to set off a radiation alarm at some port and people are going to think it's a dirty bomb or something like that. Um, so that's not here yet because the, the tuna haven't migrated across the Pacific. But I'm thinking that by about 2013, um, we might see contamination of the of the water and of the top of the food chain fishes. And you can't do it in air. It has to be done underwater. So my guess is they'll have to build a building around the building um, to provide enough shielding and, and water 
so that they can then go in and uh, and put this fuel into a, a heavy lift, lift canister. Okay. All right. I hadn't I hadn't considered that. That's a great insight. So let me summarize here. We have we have these four reactors. Three of them have melted through. Um, one of them is is uh, fuel out. And um, you know, I used to do this as a living, and and um, and Unit Four has me stumped. Hmm. So what do they do? Do you think? I think they'll be forced to build a building around the building, and then because you need heavy lifting cranes, uh, cranes that lift 150 tons, which are massive cranes, um, to put the nuclear fuel into um, into canisters. Which is there, is there some way that they can maybe just throw up their hands and, and just pour a bunch of concrete on this and call it a day? I think eventually they may get to the point of throwing up their hands and pouring the concrete on. They can't do that yet because the cores are still too hot. So we're going to see the, the dance we're in for another year or so until the cores cool down. Um, at, at that point, there's not uh, anywhere near as then can, can get removed. Um, that's sort of what happened to TMI, but all of the fuel at TMI was, uh, was still at the bottom of the vessel. But it was a three-year process to get the molten fuel out of, out of Three Mile Island. Four years, actually. So um, the problem here is that all of the cranes that do that have been destroyed, on, on, at least on units one, three, and four. So as much decay heat. And you probably could consider filling them with concrete and just letting them sit there like we have at, at Chernobyl as a, as a giant mausoleum. That would work for units one, two, and three. Um, unit four is still a problem because, um, again, all the fuel is at the top. You can't put the concrete at the top because you'll collapse the building. And it's so radioactive you can't lift the nuclear fuel.